start from chapter 8 and work backwards. Yeah. Chapter 8 of Proverbs. Does not wisdom call and does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portal she cries out. To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. O simple ones, learn prudence, acquire intelligence. You who lack it, hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right, for my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to one who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. I, wisdom, live with prudence and I attain knowledge or give knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Well, maybe we ought to stop there because there are the two key words. Prudence in verse 12 and perverted in verse 13. And so you have to see the one as opposed to the other. Maybe I'll give you a, 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 a dictionary definition of what it means, what perverted, perverse, perverseness, perversity, per, uh, all of those words mean from their root because in chapter 2 of Proverbs just turn back a few pages and again we see two words coming up in opposition one to another starting from verse 6 for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding he stores up sound wisdom for the upright he's a shield to those who walk blamelessly guarding the paths of justice and preserving the way of his faithful ones, then you'll understand righteousness and justice and equity in every good path, for wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Prudence will watch over you and understanding will guard you. It will save you from the way of evil, from those who speak perversely, who forsake the paths of uprighteousness, who walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, those whose paths are crooked and who, and who are devious in their ways. Crooked is actually at the heart of the definition of what is perverse. Perverse is to take something that is initially straight, true, and right, and give it a twist or a crook that, that makes it uh, the opposite than what it was intended to be. It's a deviation. So we know that perversity in sex is a deviation the man who's perverse in sex is no longer functioning as a man. He's a homosexual. He's, not, he's no longer de desiring that which is natural to his gender, but what is perverse and crooked to his gender. And it may well be that what begins as perverse speech will end in perverse conduct. And this whole generation of perversion that is enveloping us uh, everywhere in the, in the modern world has started first with indiscriminate speaking and, and unrighteous thoughts and, and expression, allowing a crook to come into things that, however right we were in the expressing of them, we made them wrong by a wrong spirit that gave it a twist that was a deviant, out of the way kind of thing. And if you persist in that, <coughs> it begins in speech will end in conduct. So what's the alternative? The alternative is to be prudent. And in a moment, I'm going to give you a definition of prudence. This isn't my wisdom, saints. This is Webster's Dictionary and is available to you all if you'll bestow yourself to use it. It's a remarkable source. And it's a, I, I never cease to stagger that the simplest words, when you turn to the dictionary, give such amplification of meaning of what you thought you knew, you realize you knew only in part. So here's what the dictionary says about perverseness. Deviant, turn the wrong way. Isn't that remarkable? It could be a truth, but it's turned the wrong way, and it becomes perverse. The truth becomes a lie simply because it's been turned. Uh, a corrupted form, uh, turned into a corrupted form, turned to error, and, uh, 
corrupting others, leading astray, misdirecting. So when it says um, wisdom and prudence will save you, by the way, there's no wisdom without prudence, because as we have already read, wisdom issues from prudence. So prudence will watch over you, it says in verse 11 of chapter 2, and understanding will guard you. It will save you from the way of evil. That means that we need to be saved. That means that there's no one who's automatically safe. There's no one who's exempt. And that this is a daily keeping of yourself because it says in the same book of Proverbs, chapter 4, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it issue all of the issues of life. This, this, this requires a continual watch care. It's very easy to lapse into something and just give it a slight twist because you, you enjoy that or, or you're enjoying someone being inflicted when, you, when you're not only speaking the truth but inserting it and turning the handle to make sure that they get zinged. As I read and I shared with the folks at the yesterday's prayer time, George Will, in his article uh, in this week's Newsweek, talks about the massacre of Jews in Poland. When the Germans first came to this particular town, the first thing that the, po the Polish population asked of the German occupying troops, can we murder our own Jews? Oh yes, by all means, take your liberty. And they had a bash. They, they killed the entire Jewish population. Women took their babies and drowned them in the, in the, in the common pond, and then sought to drown themselves, rather than to fall into the hands of these men who were so malicious in their torture. And one of the statements was, the Germans said to the, to the Poles, uh, you're, you're killing them too easy. Let them suffer longer. So it's just talk about perverse, talk about twisted. What's the origin of that? You don't, you're not born like that to perform something like that in a moment. It has to have a history. Yeah. Before you can act like that, you have already thought like that. You have already spoken like that. The fact of the matter is that they did not keep their hearts. They did not esteem the word of the Lord nor his way. These were Christians, Polish Catholics, but they were not in the word. They did not heed. And uh, so they acted corruptly and we need to be careful about our own hearts, for it will save you from the way of evil, from those who speak perversely, but more than that, save you from yourself speaking perversely. So that's why the word cry comes up frequently here in chapter 2. If you indeed cry out for insight and raise your voice in verse 3 for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it, as for hidden treasures, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of, of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up wisdom for the upright. Wisdom and prudence go together. Because now I'll tell you what prudence means. Prudence is the employment of wisdom. It's acting with discretion. I thought I was going to tell you. Prudence means having forethought or foresight. What does that mean? That before you open your mouth, even to be correct or to bring correction, you think in advance what will be the consequence <coughs> of this, even if it's true. Uh, is it a truth that is worth inflicting damage to a to state? Or is this the time? Is this the prudent time for such a correction? See what I mean? The prudent man does not just blurt out. He sees something that deserves correction. He's got the scriptures to back him. Boom. The prudent man has forethought and foresight. He takes into consideration what will be the consequence of this speaking now. Is this the right moment? And if it is, how must I express it so that it will be not misconstrued, misunderstood, and do harm, though I intend good? Prudence is a remarkable quality of foresight and forethought. Most of us just blurt out. We act in the moment. Something happens, something comes to our thought, our tongue, boom, we say it and we do it. That's not prudent. Prudence requires wisdom. 
the, these are God's own qualities, and it says that wisdom stands at the gates and at the crossings of the, of the streets and cries out to be heard. So this is God. Wisdom is God, and God is crying out. Evidently, it's more urgent for him than it is for us, or he would not be crying. <laughs> Why is he crying? Because he sees with a perfect and undiminished eye all of the damage, the harm, and the devastation, not only that come from the unbelieving and the unrighteous, but even from the saints, because they're not acting, living prudently. And so prudence and wisdom is a very requisite of God. For, uh, for just as a little interesting side note, how did the Lord bring me to the Lutheran seminary? Through Gary Cruzy's mouth. I took Gary to the seminary to shoot down the possibility that I would have to go there. Was God really calling me to go to a liberal Lutheran seminary with, with all of those lesbians and, and witches and, and feminists? So I took Gary, of course, he's anti-intellectual, anti-theological. I thought, he'll surely shoot this down. I sat him in the class, he heard the professor, and it couldn't have been worse. It was like right out of Hollywood with the professor with leather patches on his elbows, a pipe. I mean, just the kind of thing to turn Gary off. We left the room, we didn't say a word. We're walking down the hallway. I, I was waiting for the, the bottom to drop. And Gary, we came to the door, he turned to me and he said, I perceive that God wants you to be here at the seminary to learn prudence. Mm. And when he spoke the word prudence, it went into my heart like a shaft, like an arrow. And I knew that I knew that God wanted me in that place not for theology, but for prudence. Why prudence? Because I was a, I'm was a hot-headed, or I was, intemperate guy on the spot, let them have it, give them what they deserve, the truth, let the, let the chips fall where they may. And God wasn't going to allow a bull in his china shop because the issues of the last days are exacting and delicate and issues of life and death and the, 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 the bringing something to the church that has been long neglected and will be resisted. You can't come as a bull and bring those things. You've got to come in the prudence of the Lord. You've got to come in the wisdom. Wisdom and prudence are interlocked. And so I learned it. And I'm, I'm continuing to learn. And uh, the pity is I didn't learn it earlier. Because as I, I said, and uh, my detractors have jumped on, I have done more harm in the name of truth than most men have done in error. That's what you can do when you're bumptious, uh, inflated, confident that you have the truth and, and you're going to speak it and do it no matter what. So foresight, forethought, self-disciplined caution. Why? Because the ego always wants to be expressed, always wants to show itself off even in, in what is correct. But because we're certainly not going to be uh, bringing honor on our heads by speaking lies, but by speaking truths and bringing correction, yes, that could be an ego trip. So what is prudence? Prudence is self-discipline. Prudence is holding something and not blurting it out immediately with a sense of caution about first examining one's own heart before speaking to that point or to that issue. And that's a discipline because the flesh wants now to receive the gratification of being heard, acknowledged, people patting you on the back. Boy, that was real something. You really said it. You were, you were fearless, whatever. It, it's amazing how we can be ego-driven over spiritual things. That's right. So it's a discipline to keep that filthy thing checked and to be cautious and know what is the deceitfulness of our own hearts and wait until the Lord will give a proper occasion, time, and release for that very thing. And when it comes forth in his time and in his way, it will come forth as if he himself has spoken it. And you'll not receive any of the credit. You'll not be able to boast. And the person or the church or body to whom those words are addressed will receive it as a life-giving word. There will be no recoiling. One, one of the characteristics of uh, righteousness is peace. So what, uh, whatever is being conducted, even necessary correction, if it is being conducted in the prudence and wisdom of God, the end thereof will be peace. And if it's not, the end thereof will be strife. So one of the ways you can know whether you're imprudent or prudent is what has been the result 
of your speaking or sharing? Amen. Has it brought strife or has it brought peace? Amen. So we need to be cautious about ourselves. Provident, circumspect, conducting itself judiciously. Is that fancy language? To be circumspect. I don't have a, I don't have a synonym for that. If, if we had the ample time, and I encourage you to do it yourself, reading from Proverbs from 2 through chapters 8, you'll come to the phrase, the skill of wisdom. It's in the scripture. A skill of wisdom? That implies that there's something that can be perfected. That maybe you start out amateurishly, and you're blunt, and, and uh, coarse, and miss it, but it's a skill that can be perfected through a kind of training in discretion. You, you're not born discreet. You're not born wise. You're not born prudent. The, we can grow in these things so much as they are value for us. Here is God crying out in the streets to be heard. And when we will take it to heart, because this is the fear of God and the knowledge of God, and it's the way of peace and righteousness and blamelessness, he'll give us every grace to grow in this. You don't have to wait until you're 72. You don't have to wait until you've left the trail behind you of uh, broken and bloodied and beaten people who have suffered the result of your improvidence and your lack of, of restraint, your lack of caution, your lack of discretion. You can learn this early and well because Proverbs is really a book intended for the young. But the, the old can continue to, uh, to receive benefit. I can't find the word skill. Maybe it was in the Amplified, mm -hmm. but I, I can't. But I saw this morning two or three times. It struck my uh, interest that there's a skill in this. And it can be developed. Yeah. Well, but, what about but it? chapter 8 does talk about, well, what about um, verse 4 of chapter 8. To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. Isn't that remarkable? This is God's intention for all mankind. It would certainly make the earth habitable and at peace. Even if the unbelieving would submit themselves to the, to the wisdom of God's way, yeah. there would be such benefit. But uh, my cry is to all that live, O oh, simple ones. What does it mean, simple? Those who choose not to be instructed. Perverse. Yeah, who have no thought yeah. beforehand and yeah. go on like... Right. Learn prudence. There's a learning here. Acquire intelligence, you who lack it. Hear, for I will speak noble things, for my lips will come what is right. All the words of my mouth are righteous, nothing twisted or crooked in them. Wisdom is of God. True speaking is of God. Because all his, they are all straight to one who understands. Those who find knowledge take my instruction. So it's something given from God is both wisdom and prudence to those who cherish this value and know that he's the source of it and will seek him first. This is part of the self-discipline, sort of blurting out from your own inadequate understanding to wait and be cautious and look to the Lord for what is his thought on that same matter. For he is wisdom and, and prudence and will give it. Um, out of Oswald Chambers this week. The Christian life is stamped by moral spontaneous originality. Consequently, the disciple is open to the same charge that Jesus, that of inconsistency. But Jesus Christ was always consistent to God, and the Christian must be consistent to the life of the Son of God in him, not consistent to hard and fast creeds. This is an interesting thing. They are not the same. The creeds are true. The creeds are statements about God and about the faith and the way of God, but they are not God in themselves. And we can um, mindlessly give a first loyalty to the creeds rather than to God himself. And that's when truth can become twisted and perverse. So that the Christian must be consistent to the life of the Son of God in him, not consistent to hard and fast creeds. Men pour themselves into creeds, and God has to blast them out of their prejudices because before they can become devoted to Jesus Christ. Isn't it remarkable 
that a correct creed can become a prejudice that you have put you have such an investment in that creed in that doctrine in that truth that it it's not serving the purposes of God but working actually against God's purpose it's your own prejudice and instead of being faithful to the life you're faithful to the creed that's that's the Jewish condition faithful to the creed of monotheism or what they think to be the truths about God and in fact so taken up with the creeds of the faith that when they felt those creeds were threatened and challenged by Jesus they destroyed him rather than the creed the creed had taken such a place of preeminence that it was more desirable than the God who himself initially gave it and his death was required in order to preserve their creed we we are susceptible to that same danger mm -hmm. of some truth that is especially dear to us can become a prejudice and act against God and so uh, Oswald Chambers is warning about it lest we become corrupted and devious in that thing mm -hmm. and it becomes perverse though it was to begin with in itself a truth so that we need to come to the Lord learn of me I am wisdom and I am prudence and I will teach you and, and uh, don't let it harden into a body of truths to which you subscribe with such a vehemence even defending God by them that it becomes uh, a devastating thing rather than a blessing because it says uh, I love those who love me in verse 17 of chapter 8 and those who seek me diligently find me riches and honors are with me wisdom is God and with God and I'm glad that he's kept it to himself I'm glad that it's not uh, a book uh, in which we can imbibe and draw from and make it a creed and apply it but that there's an ever and continual necessity to go to him who is in himself wisdom and prudence and this is discretion is always to make room for the Lord and to allow him in on, on the thing that's in your heart to express that requires a relationship for which he's jealous because it says in chapter 2 For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk blamelessly, guarding the paths of justice, preserving the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity in every good path. When? When you get it from him who stores it up, who saves it for the saints, who gives it. He, him. Then you'll understand righteousness justice equity every good path for wisdom will come into your heart it's not coined out of your brain it's not the result of your brilliance it's not your cleverness it's not your analysis your critique it's something that comes from God who is wisdom wisdom will come into your heart he will give it to you when he sees that you're looking toward him because you recognize that he's its source and not yourself it will save you from the way of evil to which we are every one of us prone even in our best intentions if we are not prudent from those who speak perversely but it will guard you from even more not from those who speak perversely but from yourself speaking perversely taking a correct thing and making and giving it a twist that makes it corruptive rather than ben than beneficial mm -hmm. we mustn't be content with getting by our relationships are too delicate and the enemy is, uh, is waiting at every moment for any opportunity to bring corruption by something that is stated that is clumsy or unwise. We need to walk with great discretion in the church and in the body, in our, uh, with our children, in marriage, in relationship. We're talking about souls here that can be bruised, set back, the church itself disfigured. And what shall we say for those that we're inviting to learn that they might 
bring to Jews the hard word of the last day's extremity to which they will be facing and the uh, alternative which is safety in Messiah unless they can bring these thoughts with discretion and with wisdom what do you do when a Jew blurts out in anger and attacks you which they're going to do uh, how, what is your response to that if you react in kind and get insulted or offended or talk back if you're unwise and imprudent if you're not cautious and discreet you've lost them you see what I mean? One moment can lose the whole investment. So we need to cherish this, seek for it, call for it. And in, verse, in chapter 3 of Proverbs, by the way, read the Proverbs every day. I read the Psalm for the day and the chapter of Book of Proverbs for today. Today is the 8th, so the 8th chapter. That's why I was into it. And uh, it's inexhaustible. But in chapter 3, verse 13, that begins with an italic title, The True Wealth. Happy are those who find wisdom. That means it's outside of us, and we have to look for it, not in ourselves, but in Him, and those who get understanding, because there's a God who gives it if we seek Him for it. For her income is better than silver, and her revenue better than gold. The consequences of, of wisdom and understanding and prudence is beyond any kind of natural physical wealth. And indeed, by it, physical wealth could be obtained. She's more precious than jewels. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. Left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness. And all her paths are peace. So I repeat, you'll know whether you're in the path of righteousness through prudence, wisdom, and understanding, or through being imprudent and uncautious by, by seeing what is the result of what you speak or do because everything that issues in God's wisdom must eventuate in peace all her paths are peace peace is the crown and the testimony of God's approval and presence because what is spoken and what is done is in keeping with his own character and his own heart so she is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her those who hold her fast are happy then it goes on to say that the Lord by wisdom founded the earth, by understanding he established the heavens, by knowledge the deeps broke open, the clouds dropped down the dew. If very creation issued out of the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of God, if that was required to set in motion the very creation that we occupy, what then about the things that we are about? If God could not create outside of or without understanding, prudence, and wisdom, how shall we continue? If he required it, how shall we not require it? Gary Cruz, I'm, I'm quoting him now a second time, made the interesting statement once that has always remained with me, that in most marital disputes, in arguments between husbands and wives, maybe we can say between children and parents, or even within the fellowship, the, the thing in the last analysis is the lust to get the last word in. He used the word lust. There's a lust to make sure that you have gotten in your last uh, word. So it is a lust, and we need to be uh, guarded against it. Well, we need to treasure this more than any other value, and seek it and find it and, and walk in it, and learn it. Huh? So let's, let's um, acknowledge before the Lord that we have all been blunderers, unthinking and simple, mindless. We have not given foresight nor forethought to what we say or do. We, we, in the lust of getting our word in right now, we speak it forth without thought of what will be the consequence or the damage, because once it's out, it's irretrievable. Something has gone out for death or for life. So, Lord, uh, we know that we have failed in this because it has not been commended to us. The book of Proverbs was just uh, a quaint something, I don't know, for, for who, for young people. We've passed it by. And yet you're crying out at the head of every street and every gate to be heard, crying out that we should esteem wisdom and knowledge, which is, not, is, is to say nothing more nor less than to esteem God. And we acknowledge that as much as we have been blunderers 
and and uh, um, bulls in the china shop, even in the name of truth, knocking off whole shelves of things, and failing in the very thing that for which we had hope, because we didn't wait, we were not cautious, we uh, we we were not cautious about our own propensity, about the lust to get something done, the ego of being heard. So my God, forgive us for all of that and grant us by your mercy a new esteem and respect for what issues from you, it can only come from you, which you're willing to give to those who will learn from you and receive and obtain from you knowledge, understanding, wisdom, prudence. Thank you, my God. May it become deep character of our corporate life. May our every relationship uh, be affected and be revealed in it. May we so love it, my God, uh, that it will be like a garland around our necks and a crown upon our heads, and that its peace, my God, will pervade our, our life together. Thank you for this, my God, that this is not poetry, this is not a play on words. This is the cry of God. And we've not heard it, and we have not considered it. And indeed, we have done much damage in the name of truth. So, give us, my God, a fresh day of new beginnings, new respect. Hear our cry, Lord, as we desire to learn of you. We, we desire to be prudent, to walk with restraint, to, to have discretion, to have that knowledge and the understanding which is God's, not not just in the profound last days things, but in the everyday things, in the simplest issue of conversation, in relationship, uh, and how we speak toward one another, that we would be discreet. Thank you, my God. Oh, we bless you that this is your wisdom and your desire, and may we be like you in it. Thank you, my God. Come and birth in us a new esteem, a new respect, a new desire for these things. Convict us where we have been mindless headlong. Give us a love for the peace that is the crowning hallmark of that which is prudent and wise. Always. We thank you, give you praise, Lord, that this was the thought of your heart for us this morning. Surely not a moment too late. And we, ble we are blessed and we receive it as coming, my God, from your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord, that we can learn from the dictionary not only the synonyms, but the antonyms, that the antonym for prudence is haste or ra being rash, that, this, that the antonym for prudence is perverseness. So we want to be saved out from being perverse, from being having a crook, being twisted, uh, 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 communicating a corruption rather than a correction. So, Lord, teach us words and, uh, and give us a love for them, for they signify true things. And we want to be a people, my God, pleasing in your sight. Thank you for the great gifts that you're willing to bestow for those who will cry out and seek them and learn from them in Jesus' name. This rendering in the Amplified could be a, uh, a real invitation from the Lord to those who are tossing this over in their minds and can't see their way through to this. My son or daughter, if you will receive my words, assuming that this sharing this morning were his words, and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive, it be such an emphasis on our responsibility to hear making your ear attentive to skillful, skillful and godly wisdom. Here's where I saw that word in the Amplified. And inclining and directing your heart and mind to understanding, applying all your powers to the quest of it. It's as if it's the foremost consideration that deserves our fullest energy before any other consideration. And that's true. Because if we have not wisdom, prudence, and understanding, how do we proceed to anything else? This has got to pre be the first consideration. Yes, if you cry out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek wisdom as silver and search for skillful and godly wisdom as for hid treasures, then 
you will understand the reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives skillful and godly wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He hides away sound and godly wisdom and stores it for the righteous. Those who are upright and in right standing with him, he's a shield to those who walk uprightly and integrity, that he may guard the paths of justice. He preserves the ways of the, of the saints. Then you will understand righteousness. That came up recently in one of the meetings. I said, can you define righteousness? People blanked out. They didn't know how to begin. Then you will understand right. And if we don't understand righteousness, there's no moral basis for our life at all. Righteousness is ultimate, almost beyond defining. It is what God is in himself, in his own impeccable rectitude. Then you'll understand righteousness, justice, and fair dealing in every area and relation. Yes, you'll understand every good path, for skillful and godly wisdom shall enter into your heart. The Lord has, has put it there, and knowledge shall be pleasant to you. Discretion shall watch over you, understanding shall keep you, to deliver you from the evil and the evil man who speak perverse things, men who forsake the paths of righteousness, to walk in the ways of darkness, who are crooked in their ways and devious in their paths.